Now we have to look at bolt shear. So in bolt shear, we have this tension connection where we're pulling both sides, and we're expecting now that these plates are stronger than the bolt, and the bolt is going to rip apart, something like that. So when we look at the strength of bolt shear, we're looking at the strength of the bolt as it is being ripped apart here. Now there's two considerations. Uh, we're going to look at where exactly the plane of shear is. In this particular instance, the plane of shear, uh, as we showed it, was in the thread of the bolt. Um, so we need to look at the area in the thread of the bolt, which will be smaller area than the area in what we call the shank. All right, so as we develop the formulas for shear strength of bolts, we need to be cognizant of where the bolt is failing. Is it failing in the shank or in the thread? And then we also need to know the size of the bolts and uh, keep in mind that it's in shear. Uh, and so shear strength differs from ultimate tensile strength. All right, so let's define how we calculate bolt shear strength. So first we need to figure out which bolts we have. So the, these are the groupings. Uh, we often refer to A325 bolts or A490 bolts, and these are group A and group B respectively. Bolt technology is one of the things that is continuing to advance in steel construction, so we see that more grades and more groups of bolts have been added to the specification as we move through the years. Next, we'll take a look at the nominal shear strength as given to us in section J3.6. So the nominal shear strength or the nominal resistance is just equal to some nominal tensile strength or nominal shear strength times the area of the bolt. So a very straightforward calculation. Again, since we're looking at ultimate fracture of this bolt, we're going to take phi to be 0.75. And we'll talk about how we come up with FNV, the shear stress in the bolt, in a second. So very simply put, we get the nominal shear strength from the value that's given to us in AISC table J3.2. So for any grade, any group of structural bolts, we can go directly to table J3.2 and determine what the nominal shear stress for that bolt should be. Now I, I like to give you a little bit of background in my course. So I want to give you a little bit of how, how do we arrive to this value that's in table J3.2. So to do that, uh, we actually calculate the nominal shear strength as 0 0.9 times 0 0.625 F sub U. Now how do we arrive at these values? We actually arrived at these values from tests. So experimental tests were done on a wide variety of bolts. And we found that the factor 0 0.9 is a length factor. And basically, we use 0 0.9 whenever the length of our connection is less than or equal to 38 inches. So a 38-inch long connection is a very long connection. So most connections that we make are less than 38 inches long. And so that is how we apply this formula, this factor 0 0.9, to the nominal shear strength. Now the 0 0.625 F sub U also comes from that research. Uh, that research was performed by Fisher and his associates at Lehigh University uh, in 1978 is when they published their results. And basically, you can almost think of the 0 0.625 as a very similar to the 0.6 F sub U that we use elsewhere when we're calculating the shear strength of a member. So if we want to take a look at how we get these calculations for an A325 bolt, an A325 bolt has a nominal ultimate strength of 120 KSI. So our bolts are hardened steel, and they have a much higher strength. Uh, they've been hardened and heat treated compared to uh, our regular plate steel. So bolts will have a much higher strength compared to plate steel. So for an A325 bolt, we calculate FNV by taking 0 0.9 times 0 0.65 times 120 KSI, and that gives us 67.5 KSI. If we compare this to the value that we get from table J3.2, we would find that the value from the table is 68 KSI. So they've gone ahead and rounded this up to the nearest integer.
For the nominal tensile strength, I'm just going to point you right to this table. So it's actually the same table, J3.2. If you have any questions on where some of these values come from, I always recommend you can check the commentary to the specification. So that's where I learned about the above uh, research that was done for shear strength of bolts. Actually, if you move to the commentary for uh, section J3.2, you will find all this information given there. We also have to define the area of the bolt, which is going to give, be given the variable A sub B. So the area of the bolt is very straightforward, right? It's a circular, has a circular cross section. So the area of the bolt will just be pi over 4 times the diameter of the bolt squared. However, the diameter of the bolt changes because the way that the bolts are made, uh, they're one diameter, right? And then when it gets threaded, we lose a large portion. So we call that portion that is still remaining of the unthreaded section, the unthreaded portion, or we call that the shank of the bolt. And then we have the threaded portion, which is everything else, the rest of the bolt. Now when we're looking at the cross-sectional area, if we just use pi over 4 times the diameter of the bolt, that's going to give us the cross-sectional area of the unthreaded bolt. So when we define you know, a bolt is 3 quarter inch diameter, we're talking about the unthreaded portion is 3 quarter inch in diameter. So that makes a difference on if our failure, if our failure is occurring in the shank of the bolt or in the threaded portion of the bolt, it makes a huge difference on the capacity as in shear as well as in tension. So I'm going to make sure I add a big warning sign here to make sure you know that if the threads of the bolt are in the plane of the shear, you must use the reduced area. So I've talked a lot about the shear plane in the connection, so I want to highlight that here. So I've drawn it in green. This is the plane of shear for this particular connection where we have two plates in like a lap splice connection, two plates sliding relative to one another, the plane of shear would be that area in green. We would also call this a bearing type connection because we can see like the top plate and the bottom plate, even though they've slid relative to one another, the holes don't perfectly align, the bolt keeps these plates from separating. In this case, the plane of the shear is through the threaded portion, and so we will take the area of the threaded portion to be approximately 80% or 0 0.8 times the nominal area of the bolt. Like I said before, we can just use table J3.2 to come up with these values. And if you look at the left-hand column, you'll see that they talk about whether or not the threads are included or excluded from the shear plane. Um, but I wanted to give you some of the background as to why and how you get these values in the table so that you're better equipped in the future if you go to do uh, something unique in design and you need to know where these values come from. Again, using the example of an A325 bolt, we know that FNV was previously calculated to be 67.5 KSI. If the threads were included, then FNV would have to be 0 0.8 times 67.5 KSI, which gives us a resulting value of 54 KSI. And you can confirm that this is the value from table J3.2. All right, how do we remember the different types of connections? I like to bring out my Texas accent. I don't really have one yet. But I like to say if threads are included in the shear plane, then you have a connection type N. If they're excluded from the shear plane, you have connection type X. So this is just a nomenclature that can be used if you can have the threads in the shear plane, you have an uh, N connection type N. If you have them excluded, it's connection type X. Now it's very, very important that if you don't know for sure whether or not your threads 
will be in the plane of shear or excluded from the plane of shear, then you must design, must conservatively assume that the threads are included. Okay, and so remember, when you're a designer, you don't really know uh, what the final condition of the structure will be. And as a designer, you're really not going to specify the shank length of the bolts and the thread length of the bolts. You're going to just say what type of bolts need to be used, and then the contractor will use bolts that meet your requirements. So therefore, when you're designing, we typically have to assume that we have the threads included in the shear plane so that we can make sure that our bolts will not be failing in the field. Only if you're very confident that the shear plane will be through the shank of the bolt, only if you're super confident, that's the only time you would ever consider designing connection type X. And now let's take a look at table J3.2 in our manuals. If I was you, I would go ahead and write in my manual this connection type N and connection type X. So we can read there for group A, for example, A325, bolts when threads are not included, are not excluded from shear planes. You can see I'm already getting confused. When the threads are not excluded from the shear planes, then they're included, so that's connection type N. When the threads are excluded from the shear plane, that's connection type X. So I would just go ahead and write these in the manual. Otherwise, you're going to get confused on sort of like the the two, the, the tricky wording that they've used there. Um, I think it's a little tricky. Um, but I write this in my manual so that there's no questions. All right, so moving on to the actual design strength of the bolt. All we need to do is to take this nominal strength from table J3.2 and multiply it by the area of the bolt. If we're making modifications to our manual, I'd go ahead and make this modification in chapter J. So in chapter J where we see this formula and we have Rn equals Fn times AB, I would go ahead and write in Ns. Ns is going to stand for the number of shear planes. So for most normal connections that we're going to design as engineers, we're going to have two possibilities. One is single shear and one is double shear. So I have graphics of both of these provided here for you. So you can see the graphic on the left, in terms of the shear transfer, we only have one shear plane through that bolt. So the total load on the left-hand side is transferred to the total right on the right-hand side. And we see that the total shear would be equal to that VPN. So we have one shear plane. This bolt is in single shear. On the right-hand side, we have a different graphic. Uh, we have sort of a splice plate connection where we have two plates on the left-hand side, but only one plate on the right-hand side. This leads to two shear planes. And if we even drew a little shear diagram for the bolt, we would see that the shear in this bolt, instead of being the whole value of VPN, the shear would only be VPN over 2. And therefore, the double shear condition would have twice the strength of the single shear condition. Um, so it's important that when we're calculating the nominal strength of the bolt, we also know whether or not the bolt is in single shear or if it's in double shear. Like I said before, for most normal connections, we're either going to be in single shear or double shear. If we have more shear planes than that, then you really have to draw out the shear diagram in your bolt and figure out what percentage of the total load VPN is being handled by your bolt. Because as you keep adding more plates, it doesn't necessarily, you know, having five shear planes doesn't mean you necessarily have five times the strength. So you'll need to really be careful about that. Um, but because it, we're regular engineers and we're not going to design these weird connections, hopefully, we will look at just single shear or double shear as our main focus for our course.
Lastly, it's important to note that the total load is the summation of the nominal resistances for each bolt or bolt hole in the connection. And we'll see how to handle that in our example problem. I also want to point you to some design aids that AISC has provided to us in the manual. So if you go to section 7, 7 is all about bolts. So we see table 7-1 has the available shear strength of bolts. So rather than using table J3.2 in the area of the bolt, it's usually easier just to come to this table 7.1. So based on an A325 bolt, you could come in and you could say, okay, I have a group A bolt. Decide whether or not the threads are included or excluded from the shear plane. Decide whether you're not in, and if you're in single shear or double shear, and then you can make your selection for phi Rn from the table. So for example, if you had an A325 bolt that was 5 8 inch diameter in single shear, with the threads included in the shear plane, you would get a value phi Rn of 12.4 kips. So keep table 7.7-1 handy uh, when calculating the shear strength, available shear strength of bolts. In addition, uh, there's a table, table 7-2 for the available tensile strength of bolts. So I would go ahead and just know that this is in there. You don't necessarily have to use the equations in chapter J to calculate these values. You have this design aid at your disposal. When we're looking at grades of bolts, how do you know what kind of bolts you have if you're actually on site? Um, all the bolts will be stamped with the values on the end. So we can take a look. This is a, you know, a black steel bolt. So this is just an unpainted steel member. And you can see it has that it's an A325 bolt. So the grade should be stamped on the end. Uh, so we know A325 would fall into a group A type bolt. Uh, that's as opposed to A490. So this is a group B bolt. A490 is a higher strength bolt compared to the A325. Um, and then here's a, a 307, ASTM 307 bolt. Um, so that's another group or category of structural bolts that we have, as well as we also have group C bolts. Uh, we also see some difference between the plain uh, bolts and the silver bolts. Um, the silver bolts have been galvanized. So galvanizing is a process in which uh, steel is dipped into a zinc uh, metal alloy and then it gets coated. And so uh, we do galvanize bolts because we don't want the bolts to corrode either, right? So galvanization provides protection for the bolt in, a, in, a, in construction from corrosion, uh, whereas the black bolts would not have that protection. So with a black bolt, you would be expecting maybe to paint your structure after you assemble it, um, or maybe even they're not gonna be exposed to the atmosphere, so you don't necessarily need to protect against corrosion. 